read uh, just a few verses out of Luke chapter 11. Begin reading verse number 14. The Bible says, And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub, and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusteth and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing. We enjoyed it. Lord, we're thankful we're headed to heaven. We're thankful, Lord, we're, we belong in the family of God. and We're thankful for you being the middle man on the cross that died for our sin and shame. And Lord, we sure do love you, and we're thankful you first loved us. God, thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you for hearing and answering prayers and for working and God moving and doing things that, Lord, we've only prayed about. And God, we're thankful, Lord, for... Uh, all your goodness and mercy towards us. Now, Father, I pray you bless those that are working with the children on the other side. Bless their efforts. I pray for those young people. Lord, any that's not been saved, I pray the Word of God would penetrate their little hearts, uh, and God, we'd see them come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Those that have been saved, may they grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And then, Father, I pray for those working with the teens, that God, you'd bless their efforts. Uh, uh, Lord, those young people face peer pressure that is beyond most of our even understanding. We have no idea what they go through. But God, we're thankful for those that dedicate their time to work with them and be there for them. And God, we pray you'd put a hedge about them and protect our young people. Uh, now, Father, we bless you. We're thankful for your good grace. Now, help us from the Word of God. Get glory to your name, and we'll thank you for it, for it's in the wonderful and holy name of the Lord Jesus. We ask it all. Amen. Amen. In these verses, I want you to notice, first of all, the act of God. We find in verse number 14 that Jesus cast out a devil, and he said it was dumb. But he said and when uh, it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, spake and the people wondered. Uh, can I say when... The Bible uses the term dumb. He doesn't use it in the way we use it. When we talk about being dumb, we talk about Brother Brian right there. But uh, when uh, the Lord's talking about somebody being, I'm only teasing Brother Brian. Uh, when the Lord talks about being dumb, uh, in the scriptures here, he's talking about the individual who was demon-possessed did not speak. But when the Lord cast out the demon, he was able to speak. Uh, uh, you see, when that demon uh, was binding that man, he controlled that man. Uh, but when the Lord set that man free, he was able to communicate with his loved ones and speak. Uh, and it astounded all of those in attendance. Uh, can I say there are still some things only God can do? And I'm glad God can deliver folks. And I'm glad he can change them. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that God can do great and mighty things in our life. We see the act of God, but notice the accusation. Uh, uh, and can I say, anytime you do something for God or God uses you, there'll be somebody uh, 
in the crowd uh, that want to accuse you doing it for your own glory, doing it for yourself. Uh, uh, they want to accuse you saying that uh, all kinds of things. Uh, but listen, uh, 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 if you're not doing anything, you're never going to be accused of anything. But if you try to live for God, there will always be somebody that's... You just live for God and God will take care of the rest. Uh, but notice the accusation, if you will, in verse 15. Uh, but some of them said he casted out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of devils. Mm -mm. Now, can I say there was no greater slap in the face than somebody tell the Lord Jesus that he was casting out a demon by Beelzebub, the chief of demons. Mm -mm. That's a, he's, he's saying that the Lord's a devil. Mm -mm. Is there anything more blasphemous? Is there anything more wicked? Is there anything that could be uh, more anti the Lord Jesus than that statement? And can I say... Uh, if you live for God, there are going to be people who tell you that you're of the devil. They're going to call you all kinds of things. And the Bible even says in the last days they'd call them which are good evil and them which are evil good. Right. Maybe you all don't remember a couple years ago we were told we were non-essential for coming to church. Right. But bars and abortion clinics were essential. Right. What they were saying were wicked things were good things, but coming to church was evil things, huh? Right. And of course, we didn't tolerate that very long. And that's why it's going to be such a blessing if I get to meet the governor. Hmm? I'm going to ask him if he watched. Because you know what I preached every time we had, you know, them two weeks we had live stream. You know what I preached. I told him every time he needed to get born again. So I'm going to ask him if he did. Huh? I can't wait for the answer on that. You say, Brother Doug, will you do that? You don't know me very well, do you? Hmm? Huh? This might be the reaping part of what he sowed. He have to, actually has to confront me. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Uh, I'm going to ask him how long it took him to look up the phone number to call them people at the health department to sick on us. Huh? I'm going to ask, hey, I already know the sheriff told me that we was number one on his list. I already know that. Huh? I always like being number one. Huh? But can you imagine they accused the Lord of being a devil? Hmm? Isn't it amazing when people don't understand stuff, they'll make up stuff. Uh, we see the act of God. We see the accusation. Now notice the antagonizing. Look at verse 16. And others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven. What bigger sign they want? Here is a guy that was possessed with the devil. He was dumb. Uh, he couldn't speak. Uh, and all of a sudden, the Lord cast out the demon, and the fellow starts uh, whistling Dixie. I think that's a pretty good sign he's from heaven. But no, they began to tempt him. They want something else. Uh, 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 it's just like when he hung on the cross. If thou be the Son of God, kiss thyself and us too. Uh, he was the Son of God. Uh, he had nothing to prove to them. Uh, uh, listen, uh, either people are going to believe on the Lord Jesus uh, or they're not. Uh, they tempted him. Uh, they antagonized the Lord. Listen, you ever have anybody get on your nerves? Now I want you to understand, the whole time the Lord walked among men, man got on his nerves. You don't, you don't understand anything about grace. Understand this. He could have smoked them. He could have called for legions of angels to just absolutely wreck their world. But he tolerated them. Because he looked beyond their accusations. He looked beyond their sin. He looked beyond all their faults. And he saw their need. And their need was a Savior. Mm. Just like he did for you and I until we got saved. We see the act of God. We see the accusation. We see the antagonizing. In verses 17 through 22, he answers them. And he basically says, A house divided against itself cannot stand. Mm -mm. He said, If Satan cast out something by Satan, then Satan couldn't stand. Mm -mm. And, and all he did was he used absolute wisdom to debunk their foolishness. And he, and he gives an answer, an account of what's going on. And then he left them scratching their heads. Mm -mm. And then we find the admonition. After he gives them the answer, he gives them a good little chewing out. Look what he says in verse number 23. He that is not with me is against me. 
And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. He just let them know. He said, either you're for me or against me. If you're not with me, you're against me. Hmm? Lord have mercy. I don't want to be against the Lord, do you? Hmm? And he admonishes them in it all. I'm interested in verse number 20. In verse 20, he says, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Again, I mentioned this morning when he's dealing with the kingdom, he's dealing with Israel, he's dealing with the millennium, and he's dealing uh, uh, with how he's going to rule and reign in Israel. And he lets them know, if I'm actually here, so is the kingdom. Mm -mm. And can anything else scare them more than that? That the kingdom had come and they didn't even know it? But I'm interested where he used the phrase with the finger of God. And with God's help, I want to preach on this little thought for a few minutes. I want to preach on when God puts his finger on it. When God puts his finger on it. Three times in the Bible we find where God uses his finger for something and to make an impact. Now can I say, when he does, he does three things. First of all, when God puts his finger on it, he conveys something. He conveys. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Can I say that when uh, uh, the Lord gave Moses the Ten Commandments, uh, uh, the Lord actually used his finger and wrote the law in the stones uh, and he gave it to him. Uh, 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 God was conveying something uh, uh, to uh, his chosen people. Uh, God was not going to leave them wandering in the wilderness with, without something to guide their lives by. Uh, when he conveyed uh, 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 by pr uh, printing the, uh, the very law on those tables of stone, uh, he conveyed the very directive uh, for their lives and our lives to live by. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, wouldn't this world be a better place if everybody adhered to just the Ten Commandments? Uh, wouldn't that be a better place uh, uh, if folks didn't steal, if folks didn't bear false witness, uh, if folks didn't murder, if folks didn't covet their neighbor's uh, uh, stuff? Uh, wouldn't it be a better place if uh, uh, this world, if everyone had no other gods before God? Uh, wouldn't that be a better place to live in? Wouldn't that be a utopia? I mean, we could say we'd have heaven on earth if everybody would live by the Ten Commandments. Uh, he conveyed the very directives uh, for our lives and for everyone to live by when he gave uh, 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 those tables of stone to Moses. Uh, with his finger, uh, he gave us that very directive. But not only that, uh, he also uh, uh, conveyed uh, what is defiled before God. Just in those Ten Commandments. Can I say, God doesn't think highly of thieves. God doesn't think highly of liars. God doesn't think highly of murderers. Uh, God doesn't think highly of people that worship anything other than Him. Uh, God doesn't think highly of folks uh, that lust after other people's stuff uh, and other people's wives. I mean, God let us know what is sinful, what is defiled before Him. We do know that the law was our schoolmaster. It brought us to the knowledge of sin. Uh, uh, Paul said without the law we didn't know what sin was. Uh, and so God gave the law uh, so we would be condemned under the law so we'd know he's lost so we could get saved. And under those Ten Commandments, God conveyed what was defiled before him. He conveyed the very directive to live our lives by. But he also conveyed uh, uh, the definitives that all the law would hinge on. Can I say that God gave some 600 more laws other than those 10 to Moses? But all the other ones hinged on the first 10. Every one of them could be traced back to that. Now, I remember uh, some of uh, you may remember Brother Melvin Sisson. Brother, Brother Melvin's uh, an evangelist. Uh, my grandfather used Brother Melvin a lot when I was a teenager. Brother Melvin's many years would preach the spring revival and the fall revival. We just loved Brother Sisson. 
And Brother Sisson was a, was a, was a tremendous preacher. Uh, and, and I can remember him saying this when I was a teenager, long before I ever surrendered to preach. Uh, uh, Brother Clint, I remember him preaching a message, uh, and he said this. He said, long before God gives a man a ministry, he gives him a message. And I didn't understand much about that, but I wrote that down. It just sounded like something I needed to write down. And can I say that uh, uh, now preaching uh, uh, some 35 years, uh, 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 I can say this, uh, uh, that God gave me a message years ago. Uh, and even though I've got different messages, uh, and all the messages, some uh, I, I don't know how many, 10,000 10, or more messages I've preached. Uh, 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 Sydney can't wait to get the box, and then she'll tell you how many is in there. But anyway, uh, of all the messages that I've preached, uh, there's one common thing. Uh, in my ministry uh, and it seems like for uh, 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 what God put in my heart uh, is I long to see God's church prosper uh, God's church to be in a state of revival uh, God's people to be spiritual and have the touch of God in their lives uh, and it seems like all the ministry uh, that God has blessed me to be a part of uh, is always pointing folks uh, to letting God have first place in their lives uh, and can I say, all the law hinged on those first ten. The first ten was the message that all the other ones would come and hinge on. And it's very important to understand. Everything else in the law, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, can be backed up by them first ten. And again, even Benjamin Franklin, who was not a Christian, who was not a spiritual man, he even said that in our public school system, at the minimum, the Ten Commandments ought to be taught. Wouldn't our schools be better if we taught the Ten Commandments? Probably wouldn't have to have police officers at the school. Mm -hmm. uh, so we see that when God puts his finger on it, first of all, he conveys. Can I say that in the second place that I want to mention where God put his finger on something, he convicts. In John chapter number 8, you know the story. In John chapter 8, uh, the Pharisees bring a woman to the Lord Jesus who was caught in the very act of adultery. Now let me just stop right here. Um, number one, my first thought is, why didn't they bring the man? Why only her? The second thing that I'm wondering is why were they there to, to witness it? Sounds like a setup to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so they bring the Lord Jesus uh, to the Lord Jesus, this woman caught in the act of adultery. Now, most scholars believe that they brought her even stark naked before the Lord. They not only wanted her to be ashamed, they wanted to shame her when they brought her to the Lord. And the whole purpose of bringing this woman to the Lord is to see how he would respond. Hmm? And they brought her before the Lord. And they told him that under the law, Moses said, you stone her. Now listen to what John 8 says in verse number 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone. Uh, ca let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. And they which heard it. Now again, he wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, uh, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. 
Now you know the rest of the story. Jesus looks at her and says, Where are thine accusers? She says, I have no accuser. Uh, he says, Neither do I accuse thee. Go and sin no more. But Jesus uh, stooped down and with his finger, the Bible said two different times he wrote on the ground. And the Bible says when they heard it, now, uh, I preached on this not long ago, uh, and the Bible says, so then faith, uh, 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 so then uh, uh, Romans 8, 17. Uh, 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 so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And did not the Lord write the Word of God? And uh, isn't it amazing how uh, when we read the Word of God, we hear it and conviction comes. Uh, faith is encouraged uh, uh, because of the Word of God. The Lord, the living Word, is writing something on the ground. It doesn't tell us what He writes. I believe He starts writing their sin. Uh, the Bible says from the eldest to the last. So the oldest one, Brother Ed, he's first in line. Uh, Jesus writes his sin. Second, Brother Bob writes it, or Brother Jack, who's ever next, writes their sin, writes their sin, writes their sin, writes. And everybody steps up, they see what he's writing. And all of a sudden, well, it's time for me to go. I thought I had that hid. How does he know? Huh? Because he's the Lord. Huh? And uh, uh, you see, when uh, uh, the Lord used his finger in this instance, he brought conviction. The first time, uh, he conveys to us what sin is. Uh, this time, uh, he shows them their sin. Uh, can I say, uh, 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 he convicts a personal sin. You know how I know it's personal? Because each one of them was guilty of something different. But yet, whatever he wrote affected each of them. Isn't it amazing how God can bring an assembly of people together? He gives one man one message, and that man preaches the message, but yet it speaks to everybody in the house. Isn't that amazing? That amazes me. huh? And some people are being blessed by it. Some people are getting answers from it. Uh, and some people fall under conviction by it. It's amazing how God uh, can do that. How does he do it? He's God. But he knew their sin, and he began to write, and it uh, convicted them of their personal sin. Can I say it also convicted them of their prideful self? It's one thing when God shows me where I'm wrong, where I have uh, uh, sin, and where I'm not right with him. It's another thing when he shows me I'm looking down my nose at somebody. Hmm. Whatever he wrote not only convicted on personal sin, also said, who are you to look at them? Look what you've done. Mm. Huh? And then he kind of put a little dagger in on it. He said, ye that are without sin, you know, cast the first stone. Huh? There's a pile of rocks. Have at it if you're without sin. Mm. I noticed nobody threw any rocks. Huh? You know, in, in reality... We'd be a, a lot less likely to judge and condemn others if we'd realize how good and how gracious God's been to us. Mm. Uh, but he convicts a personal sin, a prideful sin, but also a painstaking shame. Mm. Only the Lord can reveal something that hurts us to our core. But then in the midst of that, show us love and mercy and grace. And when we bring it to Him, He does away with it. I mean, only God can do that. God never shows you or reveals to you something that He does not like in your life to batter you with it. He always reveals things to us so that we can get it taken care of and our relationship with Him can be restored and be the best that it can be. He does it to better us, not batter us. Hmm? If God wanted to destroy us, He could. He doesn't reveal things to destroy us. He reveals things 
so that it would enhance our relationship with him. Oh, what a God. You see, when he put his finger on it, first he conveyed to us the law and what sin was. Then he, in another place, puts his finger on it to convict. The final place that I find in the Word of God where God puts his finger on it, he puts his finger on it to condemn. The Bible says in Daniel chapter number 5, and I love Daniel chapter 5, verse number 5, the Bible says, In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand. Now let me set the scene. Israel has been taken captive in Babylon. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belteshazzar, did not learn from Nebuchadnezzar's life. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, chapter number 3. He built a great golden image, said whoever doesn't bow down to it gets thrown in the furnace. Uh, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not going to do it. Uh, and you know the story. Uh, uh, they were thrown in the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar looks in. He says, uh, hey, didn't we throw in three? He said, I see a fourth man. And he's likened unto the Son of God. How do you know what the Son of God looked like? Because there's no mistake in who Jesus is. Hmm? Huh? And then he makes a decree and he says that, uh, hey, uh, 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 we're going to serve the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego only to a few years later take away from God's glory and God turns him into a beast. I mean, he grows claws, uh, grows feathers. Uh, he's out eating grass. Uh, I mean, he lost his cotton-picking mind. Uh, uh, and God, once again, proved to Nebuchadnezzar who he was. Uh, it's a dangerous thing to try and rob God of his glory. I know people today that used to sit in church and they've lost their minds. You say, why? They quit trusting God. Hmm? And so uh, now... Uh, 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 you know, then after seven years, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's put back in, 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 in his state and he worships God. And, but his son doesn't learn the lessons. And his son is having a big party. He's having a big stupor of a party. Uh, and he calls for the vessels from the house of God that they took from Jerusalem. Uh, and he starts uh, uh, drinking wine in the vessels. And he starts desecrating the vessels that were holy unto God. Uh, and in the midst of all of that, God sends a hand right on the wall. Well, it, it kind of sobers him up real quick. And he starts calling for all the wise men of the land and all the chancellors and all the soothsayers and everybody come in. Everybody's like, hey, you're on your own there, bud. And somebody says, there's a Hebrew by the name of Daniel. He interprets dreams. He might be able to take care of this. So they bring Daniel in. And the Bible says, In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Now, verse 25, here's what he wrote. And this is the writing that was written. Mene, mene, tekel yefarsin. That's the Hebrew pronouncement of, or the hillbilly pronouncement of the Hebrew word, which I don't know how you say it. But it, in hillbilly we say, mene, mene, Tickle you fair. That is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So we find that God condemns Belteshazzar. Mm -mm. God with his finger sent a hand to write, Mene, Mene, Teko, Yepharsin. What did he condemn? He condemned with the pronouncement that was made. What was the pronouncement? God's numbered your kingdom and finished it. You're done. Now listen, if the doctor says you're done, that don't mean anything. Hmm? Your neighbor says you're done, that don't mean anything. Even if the preacher says you're done, that don't mean anything. But when God says you're done, you're done. Hmm? So we see that there's a pronouncement that was made. Then the, the prosecution is weighed. He said, thou art weighed into balances and found wanting. Hmm? Now listen, we've all seen the scale of justices. And God said, Belshazzar, I weighed your righteousness against mine, and you're found wanting. 
Now, what religion has done is religion has adopted that thought and said, God's going to weigh all your good parts and all your bad parts. If your good outweighs your bad, you get to go to heaven. Wrong. God's going to weigh you against Him. And we're always found wanting against God. And then we find that the condemnation comes with the punishment is rendered. He said, I've given your kingdom to the Medes and Persians. It's going to be divided. You're done. Hmm. And can I say, that night it transpired. Hmm. So God, when he puts his finger on it, he conveys, he convicts, and then he condemned. Three times in the Bible you find where God used his finger. Now let, let me talk about this condemnation story. I always love this part of the story, and many of you have heard this, but this was something God showed me in my study years ago that brought refuge and blessing to me. Now, I know many of you got children not serving God. Now, I know you raised your children right. I know you did. I was there. I seen it. Huh? Not only her, any of you, raised your children right. But now they're grown, life has happened, and they're, they're not out living wickedly and, and, and ungodly, but they're just not in church. They're not serving God. They're not living for God. And I know many of you, that, that burdens you. That's a, a, a heartache that you have because you know the Lord's coming. You want to see your family right with God. And if any of them aren't saved, you want to see them get saved. I know that. Well, here's where I can give you a little hope. Any time a kingdom was subdued and taken over by another kingdom, the first thing that they would do, the new kingdom, would round up all the king, all the king's heirs, and anybody that served in the king's cabinet and would kill them. So that nobody in the kingdom would give any allegiance to any former Rulers. Many of you know the story of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son. When David became king, Mephibosheth over in Lodabar scared for his life. And one day, here comes the king's chariot. And he knows this is it. I, I'm the former king's grandson. Uh, I know my life's uh, uh, going to end today. Uh, but what Mephibosheth didn't know uh, is that David and Jonathan had made a covenant uh, that whichever one outlived the other one, they'd be good to the other one's heirs. Uh, and David had been looking for any of the uh, of Jonathan's heirs. They said, there's old cripple boy down there named Mephibosheth uh, and hey what happened David brought him to the palace uh, David put robes of the king on him uh, David treated him as his own son uh, and isn't that a wonderful picture of grace uh, hey we had no right to eat at the king's table uh, but we do hallelujah well Daniel when he, when he tells Badashazzar the meaning of the handwriting on the wall, Belshazzar puts gold on him, puts raiment on him. He promotes him. He is now part of the inner circle of the kingdom. That night the Medes and Persians come overthrow the kingdom uh, Belshazzar's murdered uh, they start slaughtering everybody in the court uh, but uh, hey Darius the king uh, spares Daniel. Why? Why would he spare Daniel? He should have taken him out and killed him. Why did he spare him? Well, you've got to understand who Darius is. Well, he's the king of the Medes and the Persians. Yep. He's the son of Ahasuerus. Who's that? That's uh, the king of the Medes and the Persians before him. But you've got to know who his mama was. His mama was Esther. Now you know the story of Esther. Esther, uh, 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 she's just a fair maiden in the land. Uh, Vashti the queen, uh, 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 she uh, uh, refuses to obey the king. The king puts her out as being queen. Uh, they said you need another uh, uh, queen. And they took all the fair virgins of the land uh, and they purified them. They brought them before the king. Uh, and Esther was beautiful. Esther had the right spirit. Uh, and he marries Esther. She becomes queen. Uh, Esther's raised by her uncle uh, uh, Mordecai. Uh, 
uh, uh, and Mordecai uh, lets her know, hey, for such a time as this, uh, hey, God has placed you as the queen. Maybe it'll benefit our people, the Jews, huh? Well, you know what happens. There's a wicked man by the name of Haman. He hates the Jews. And he sets forth a plot. And he hoodwinks the king. Uh, and all the Jews are going to be killed, including Mordecai. Uh, and he makes a, ga a gallus, and he's going to hang Mordecai on it, make an example. Uh, and he sends forth a decree throughout all the land on a certain date. Uh, all Jews are going to die. Well, Esther invites the king and Haman over to her house for lunch. Haman thinks, boy, I've made it now. The queen's inviting me to lunch. Oh, I'm in. Uh, and the king says, hey, uh, 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 what should be done to somebody that spares the king's life? Uh, says, oh, you ought to put the king's robe on him. Let him ride on the king's uh, horse. Uh, and everybody celebrate him. And what he didn't know is the king had done uh, uh, some research and seen where Mordecai had revealed to uh, the king that something bad was going to happen and all of a sudden spared his life. So he said, that's a good thing. So why don't you take Mordecai out and dress him up and take him throughout all the land. Boy, it made him mad. Well, then Esther finds out about the plot. And the king wants to know what's troubling her. And she goes through a series of things and finally she lets him know that all her people's going to die. And the king gets mad. He said, At whose word? He said, wicked. And she said, wicked Haman. And Haman is then hung on his own ballast. But here's the, the rest of it. They send out riders to tell everybody the Jews can live, the Jews can live, the Jews can live. So throughout the decree, uh, the death sentence is removed uh, because of Esther. Well, Esther has a little boy named Darius. Now, Darius, you know, mom and daddy's running the country. So he spends a lot of time with Papa Mordecai. And I can just see it. Just like little Ella Rose going to spend a lot of time with Big Rev. Uh, Miss Annette said, what are you going to do in that convertible? It's only got two seats. If Ella wants to take a ride, I said, you're staying home. So I told her, hey, but listen, I can just, I can just envision it. Mordecai starts telling little Dryas about how good God is and how God's people were down in Egypt and God sent a deliverer named Moses and how uh, 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 they, uh, they come out of Egypt with all the spoils, and then Pharaoh comes to destroy them, and God parts the Red Sea, and then God takes bitter waters to make them sweet. God rains manna down from heaven. Uh, God uh, opens up rocks and gives them fountains of water, and how God sustained them for 40 years. Uh, then God gave them the promised land, and then God did this, and God did this, and God did this, uh, and God delivered wicked Haman, and he tells him all the stories of the greatness of God. Now fast forward 70 years. Dreis is 70 years old when he sees Daniel. And I just can't help but believe, I know I've got a vivid imagination, but Brother Michael Jackson, I can't help but believe when they come in and they start slaughtering people, he looks and he sees Daniel, and something Miss Kay about Daniel reminds him of Papa Mordecai. He said, man, he's turned like Papa Mordecai. He's got the same features as Papa Mordecai. Yeah, he's. I bet that man's a Jew. Huh? Come to find out, he is. And you know the the story. He promotes Daniel above all the presidents and princes of the land. Daniel's uh, second in command of all his kingdom. And how they tried to hoodwink and get rid of Daniel. Uh, and uh, uh, you know what happened? They made a decree. If you pray to anybody but you, uh, King Darius, uh, let's throw him in the lion's den. Uh, well, you know Daniel three times a day, he's calling on the Lord. Uh, what happened? He just threw up his window like he always did and called upon the name of the Lord uh, and prayed. And they threw Daniel in the lion's den. Now if you study it out, Darius couldn't sleep all night. Why is he troubled that a Jew's down there getting fed to the lions? Why does that bother him? First morning light, he runs down there and he cries out. And he says, Oh, Daniel, 
Is your God able to deliver thee? All night long he's wondering, are all those stories true that Papa Mordecai taught me? Uh, is God able to deliver his people? Is God that great God? Uh, is he the one we ought to be worshiping and serving? Uh, and you know what uh, uh, Daniel said? Uh, hey, my God has sent an angel uh, and shut the lion's mouth. Uh, hey, drew Daniel out. Uh, hey, and he worshiped the God of his own heritage, uh, Jehovah God. Uh, uh, what do you say all that for preacher uh, you might have a child uh, who's not in church you raised them right you taught them the stories of the Lord uh, you taught them the other uh, story of the cross you taught them about grace uh, and they're not serving God tonight uh, the Bible says train up a child uh, in the way he should go when he's old he shall not depart uh, from it uh, they may not uh, be at church tonight uh, but they can't get away what you put in them uh, hey, in any given moment uh, God's going to put somebody in their life uh, and it's going to remind them the story that mama told them, the story that grandma told them. Uh, hey, uh, if God still got Darius, uh, he can get your young in. Uh, hey, don't lose hope. Uh, God is well able to still deliver them. Uh, yeah. Amen. Keep praying. Keep looking for the Lord to open doors to tell them. But don't lose hope. God's still working. And He's still hearing prayers you, you asked Him for years ago. Because you see, with God, there is no such thing as time. God always works right on time. And if God delivered Darius, and if it took a handwriting on a wall to get rid of a wicked king to deliver one, God knows what He's doing. When God puts His finger on it, God's got a purpose. Now listen. Sometimes God puts His finger in our life. Things He's not pleased with when He get it right. Sometimes He puts His finger in our life to point, make a point. I'm in control. We just need to submit to it. Sometimes He puts His finger in our life that He's a working. Just let Him work. But my dear friends, never run from the hand of God because that's the very hand that feeds you the very hand that holds you the very hand that's for you not against you the word of God's given for our example we can see how God moved in the past and know that he moves the same way today maybe not in the same administration but he moves because he is God trust in him look to him depend on him and if he puts his finger on something, hey, run to do what he says. Because he always does all things well. Let's all stand tonight, brother. Ray, come get a song of invitation. Maybe God spoke to your heart. Maybe put his finger on something. You need to come. Maybe you just need to come and pray one more time for a lost level. Maybe tonight you just need to come and thank you for being a good God and being your God. Maybe tonight he just spoke in another manner. Whatever he says, you just mind him. He knows what he's doing. And you just trust in the Lord. They're picking that song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the word of God. Lord, I'm glad I'd never be exhausted. We can study it, study it, study it, and then you still show us things we've never seen before. It's alive because you're alive. God, we bless your holy name. Now, God, help folks tonight. God, speak to hearts. Bless this invitation. Well, thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.